One other thing I'm going to show you since I mentioned the content filtering is if we go down to security services and content filter. The content filter is on by default. There's no global option to turn it on and off. It's only by the zones, unlike the other uh, security services. And by default, you have a basic filter that is enabled for you right off the bat. If we click on the configure button and we go to policy, here's our default policy. So there's not much here until we click on the configure button pop-ups another window and we go to URL list and here are all the categories that are categorized by SonicWall uh, and in each of these categories are hundreds and thousands of websites that they have determined to be in each of these categories and you can turn them on or off uh, to your will. So by default the basic uh, violence and pornographic and weapons and cult and drug uh, type websites are blocked for this is uh, geared for more of a, a business perspective where they, they want to block the worst of the worst and then deal with the rest from an HR perspective. So we're going to leave them turned on and we're going to close out of our windows. Uh, actually before I do that, one thing you can do in your content filter which we'll go over in another video is you can go into custom list and allow and forbid certain websites such as Facebook or MySpace or eBay or other sites such as that that you might not want in your place of business. Um, you might consider that uh, unnecessary for work use and against your computer usage policy. That's what you would do to go in there to, uh, to block those sites. You don't have to have another product. The content filter can handle that as well as those category based blockings. So what we're going to do is scroll up on our little menu here. Uh, there's little arrows down here in the corner all you have to do is mouse over them and it will move the menu up and down. You'll see me do that quite often. So I'm going to go up to network and DHCP server and I'm just making sure that my DHCP server is enabled, conflict detection is enabled so that I don't have any overlapping IP addresses and I'm checking my range. That looks okay for now. I might change that in the future. Next I'm going to go to DNS and my WAN zone already has these DNS servers set, but what I like to do is if I'm setting up uh, a static IP address or something like that, uh, or PPPoE, um, I would go into my WAN and configure that, and let's say it's a static IP. So it's going to be, you know, 127.0.0.1, whatever your IP address might be. And then I'll go with through here and set the DNS servers provided by the ISP. So, you know, this might be whatever they might have provided. So I have them uh, recorded in the Sonic in some place. But I have them there just for reference because usually the ISP gives you DNS servers that aren't necessarily the fastest out there. They, they provide them because they have to to make the internet work for you. Uh, they don't really care about them from a business perspective usually. So I'll have them in there as backups in case we need them in the future and record them in there on each port that has a WAN connection. But what I do is go under the network DNS section and you can specify DNS servers manually that will override those set on your WAN zone. So here's where I will use something such as OpenDNS and as my tertiary often I'll, I will use uh, the Google DNS server or you could use uh, the 4.2.2.2 or 4.2.2.1 but usually I'll, I will set uh, OpenDNS as my primary and alternate uh, and then I will have Google as my tertiary just in case uh, as if uh, in case uh, OpenDNS server goes down and then if everything else if, if those two end up going down and the only DNS servers you could ever use uh, end up being the uh, ISP DNS servers, then you can go in here and say just inherit them from the WAN, 
reboot your DHCP clients, they'll get the new DHCP ser or the DNS servers, and, and then everything will work fine. So I will leave that set manually. Apply that. And then lastly what I do is I will from a configuration standpoint is I will check the firewall name and make sure that it the serial number matches that which is listed on the status page. Uh, I like to have them match uh, just in case uh, I've run into weird problems before. Also on this page, uh, which we'll go into detail in another video, is you can enable additional management such as SNMP, Simple Network uh, Management Protocol, um, or GMS if you have the global management system from SonicWall uh, to assist you in remote management and statistics on your SonicWall device. One thing you might find useful uh, is for a sonic wall, you can manage it from your local area network uh, by default. So if you go in and configure your LAN and take a look, it says I can manage it using HTTP, I can manage it with HTTPS for secure, I can ping it, uh, I can't SNMP by default, but I can also SSH do it. And there is, there is an SSH command line interface uh, to the sonic walls, which is uh, as of the time of this video is made in August of 2011, they are, uh, from what I'm told, rewriting the command line interface to be more uh, expansive uh, in what its capabilities are. So by default we have that available from the LAN, but what if I'm remote from my location? If I'm the IT administrator, I'm not going to want to drive into uh, the building every time I have to make a change and I'm out at a conference or something like that, or I'm, I work remote and I have 10 different buildings, I'm not going to want to drive to each building to make firewall changes. So what you can do is go to your WAN and configure that and then set that to allow HTTPS management. Now you can also have it do HTTP or you can have it redirect HTTP traffic to HTTPS traffic. I like to make it just secure so I, I uncheck that add rule to enable redirect and I only have HTTPS enabled. Uh, I'll also have ping enabled so I can do diagnostics to see if it's responsive in any way. Uh, and I also enable SSH. And I will have another video as well on remote management and how to lock that down even further. You can make a firewall rule to allow these protocols only from a certain range. So maybe you know the range that you normally uh, receive at your home or uh, at your main office or something like that, you can lock down these remote management protocols from a uh, specific range of IP addresses so that you don't have to worry about other people trying to brute force uh, your remote management. So we're going to enable that. And at this point, we're done from a configuration standpoint. This is my basic build for a SonicWall device. Uh, this is kind of like my best practices set up. I made sure all the firewall advanced features are on, made sure all the security services are enabled properly, made sure that the uh, TCP settings are, are enabled. Speaking of which, I did not. <laughs> If we go to firewall and TCP settings, we want to enforce our checksum and handshake compliance to make sure that uh, everything is on the up and up with our TCP sessions. So now at this point we're done. So now that we have all of our configurations done, we're going to go to system and settings, and I'm going to create backup settings. It'll say this will overwrite your backup settings. We don't have any, so that's okay. 
and it's going to make our backup settings. So now we have a snapshot of our firmware, uh, whatever our latest firmware version is at this, t at this time, and a copy of all of our settings that we made. And this will be available if we go back into that safe mode, that management mode of the sonic wall by holding in the paper clip uh, on the reset button. And if you go in there, it will now say current firmware with backup settings, or if we uh, uploaded firmware, it would also have backup settings as an option as well. So what we have there is a snapshot. So if something ever goes wrong with our settings, which they have on occasion, I've seen it before where the settings file gets corrupted or something like that, maybe there's a power failure uh, or, or some sort of surge and it causes something to short in the sonic wall, you'll lose your settings uh, or they get broken in some way. You can reset the sonic wall by holding in that, uh, that button for the 10 to 15 seconds and get it into that maintenance mode. And you can say boot with current firmware with backup settings and then it will take you back to this point in time. Also, we're going to export our settings. And what this does for me is it gives me a copy of our settings file as well. So in case that backup settings button doesn't work and the, you know, for some, somehow the backup settings also get corrupted, I'm going to export these settings and then save them. So I'm just going to save them on my desktop right now. And that creates them as an EXP format, which can then be imported into a Sonic Wall. So if you have that settings file, you can have a brand new Sonic Wall out of the box and kind of use it as an image and import the settings and then tweak them from there for another Sonic Wall. Or if you are upgrading one to another, uh, a newer model uh, or an, an upgraded model, maybe you're going from a TZ100 to a TZ210 or uh, uh, and then let's say 240 or something like that. Uh, you can import your settings from your prior version, uh, your prior Sonic Wall, as long as it's the same uh, version. So if it's this is 5.6 enhanced, if the other Sonic Wall is 5.6 enhanced, then it will probably work. It might also work if you do Sonic Wall enhanced 5.6 to 5.8, as long as it's in that same general family of uh, firmware versions and type, uh, the enhanced type. Uh, you should be fine. I've, I've had that happen and it works okay. So that gives you a great way of uh, saving your settings file and storing them so that in, in case of an emergency you have those settings. Lastly, you'll go, you want to go to diagnostics here and check off VPN keys, ARP cache, DHCP bindings, and Ike info and tell it to download the report. And what this is going to do is also take all the settings off of your sonic wall but export them in a plain text format called a text support request file, a TSR file. Whenever you talk to SonicWall support uh, about an issue, most of the times they want your TSR file. And that's what this is. And they'll say, please check off all of these four options and click download report or send the diagnostic reports and they will get sent to SonicWall uh, at their FTP server. So what we, I like to do is I take a copy of the, this file myself so not only do I have the binary file that is used to import uh, the settings, that EXP file that we just saved, but I also have a plain text version that I can read through. So the settings file is actually a binary file that you can't look at. It's just a bunch of gibberish if you open it up. The text support request gives you verbose information in a plain text format that you can read, but you can't import it into the sonic wall. So between the settings file and this TSR file, we can now rebuild our sonic wall from scratch if, if something goes horribly wrong. So we're going to export this and save this as well. You can see it saves it as a WRI file, just a simple write document. And now we have that saved. So now we have all of our settings set, we have all of our settings saved, we have the backup settings saved, we have them exported, and we have the TSR export as well. So at this point we're done. Uh, and then from there we will uh, tweak this further and I'll have uh, more videos at this point uh, in the future uh, about how to use more features in your sonic wall.